Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. This video is part two of my flight from New York's JFK Airport to Las Vegas's Harry Reid Airport. If you haven't watched part one, make sure you check it out. It's the video I posted right before this one. In that video, I focused heavily on air traffic procedures departing JFK while making my second flight on the same Boeing 767-400 that I was on just a few weeks before this. In this video, I pick up where I left off and I focus on the beautiful views from the large windows of my 767. As a passenger in the Delta One cabin, I had several windows to myself and I took full advantage of them. So how do you know where Peter Masella's seat is on an airplane? Well, basically, I am the only person on this side of the airplane whose window shade is open. Let's go find out where my seat is. are closed except mine. There's some great views out there. Why not look out? And I like to identify what I can see, like this view of wind turbines. And then I saw Jackson, Ohio, a city of just over 6,000 inhabitants. Just a few moments later, I was able to spot Cincinnati, Ohio, with its tall buildings and the nearby Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport, which is located in the state of Kentucky. CVG Airport, as it's known, is a hub for several cargo carriers and is a former hub for Delta Airlines. Don't forget to check out my video from November where I flew out of this airport. In this view, you can see the airport's three parallel runways and one crosswind runway. You can see the large cargo ramps on the south side of the airport. If you follow Jeb Brooks here on YouTube, he posted a great tour of this airport late last year and it includes some great footage of the airport behind the scenes. Check that out. I need to plug in my phone because I'm using it to track my flight. There's so much up here to see after our cloudy departure from JFK. In-flight entertainment? Sorry, not for me. I've got the window seat. Here we are over Rolla, Missouri, which is known for its half-scale replica of Stonehenge in the UK. We're now passing over Florence, Kansas which isn't named for Florence, Italy, but rather the daughter of the third governor of Kansas. It has a population of less than 400. There are many small towns among the fields here, like this one, Heston, Kansas. Heston, Kansas has a population of around 3,500. Lawn mowers and farm equipment are manufactured here in Heston. We then pass by the much larger Hutchinson, Kansas, with a population of 40,000. There's a good size airport there, but for commercial service, passengers drive to nearby Wichita. On the other side of the airplane is Wichita, but it looks like only one passenger on that side in this cabin cares for the view. What a shame. Here's a look back at the wingtip of the 767-400. The raked wingtips help reduce weight and improve cruise efficiency. We're in our in route phase of flight, and in route air traffic control centers are monitoring us and this other aircraft that I spotted as we fly over circular crops using center pivot irrigation. This allows watering equipment to rotate around a central pivot. This is not the same as a crop circle, which is created by flattening the crop. As we continue further west, the landscape becomes drier. This Delta 767-400 has a wonderful flight tracking map allowing for passengers to see their location from a variety of perspectives. I use the map in front of me here to identify that we were just south of La Junta, Colorado at this point. La Junta means the junction in Spanish, and it's at the junction of the Santa Fe Trail and a road to Pueblo. Things are starting to get very scenic up here, and I'm glad that my seat in front of the very large wing has some unobstructed views. The view is quite beautiful, and from here, the scenery is about to get even more dramatic as we approach the Rocky Mountains. The Rockies stretch from Canada to New Mexico and are the largest mountain chain in North America. While the view is intense from above, quite often flights passing over this area experience turbulence because there are often high surface winds around the mountains, leading to mountain waves which can cause gains or losses in altitude and turbulence. 
I've experienced some pretty rough air while taking in these views, but today's ride is completely smooth. I don't mind the turbulence, but it does making filming out the window a bit shaky. Throughout this area, there are some small scattered towns, like this one, San Luis. It's located in Colorado at the very bottom of the state. This is the oldest town in Colorado that has been continuously inhabited. Here's another one, Manassa. Founded by Mormon pioneers in 1879, today the town has a significant Mexican and Spanish population. Here's a look back inside the cabin to remind you that I'm on a plane with other people, but I can't see anyone around me and nobody can see me. Back to the window. As we continue towards Las Vegas, we fly over northern New Mexico. The body of water seen here is the Navajo Reservoir, which sits on the border between New Mexico and Colorado. If you like fishing, this is the place to be. Rainbow trout, bluegill, and northern pike are just some of the kinds of fish in this body of water. Before we fly over Arizona, we're offered a spectacular view of ship rock in New Mexico. Navajo for rock with wings, this is an isolated rock rising 1,500 feet above the plains around it. This is a natural national landmark and governed by the Navajo Nation. It's quite a sight from up here. We're now entering northern Arizona, an area known for its red rocks. Again, it's a marvel to see it from up here. On the western side of Arizona, the right side of this aircraft provides for a stunning view of one of the most recognizable and iconic geographic features of the American Southwest, the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is in Grand Canyon National Park. The canyon is formed by the Colorado River, and on the walls of the canyon, you can see nearly two billion years of history. The Grand Canyon is 277 miles long, and at its widest point, it's 18 miles. It's over one mile deep. We're looking at the canyon from its south side, following the standard terminal arrival procedure to our destination of Las Vegas. I am so fortunate that I'm seated on the right side of this 767. What a spectacular view. This makes up for the fact that it was cloudy when I left New York City earlier this morning. If you haven't watched part one of this two-part video, don't forget to check that part out. For now, I'll let you enjoy these phenomenal sights. After a long flight from JFK, it's time to start our descent into Las Vegas. Our pilots are talking to high altitude air traffic controllers at the Los Angeles Center where they monitor our flight on the arrival procedure and assign us lower altitudes to descend to so we can eventually land. As we descend, we're handed off to an approach control facility that handles air traffic or flights in the vicinity of Las Vegas. This is called the Las Vegas TRACON or Terminal Radar Approach Control Facility. Our view during the descent is a great view of Lake Mead. Just like the Grand Canyon, Lake Mead is a very popular tourist destination and is on the border between Arizona and Nevada. 
Since 1983, Lake Mead's water levels have been lower than what the lake can accommodate. We're looking at around 35% of full capacity in today's view. Lake Mead is actually a reservoir which provides water to Arizona, Nevada, California, and even parts of Mexico. The lake was formed by the Hoover Dam. Unfortunately, the Hoover Dam is on the left side of our plane today, but on this side we get to see the majority of the lake, which is divided into several bodies of water. While most people know that the lake's Hoover Dam is named for Herbert Hoover, most people don't realize that Lake Mead is named after Elwood Mead, who worked for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation as commissioner. It's a great day trip from Las Vegas. I know, because I've done it myself. We're now officially in our destination state of Nevada, and we're lined up with the runway as directed by the Las Vegas Approach Controller. Today, we will land on runway 26 left, which is a straightened approach. If you're flying into Las Vegas from the east like I am, I recommend sitting on the right side of the plane. Sometimes, arrivals from this direction will land to the south, and the right side will provide some great views of the Las Vegas Strip, as that approach is practically parallel to the Strip's east side. But for today, the view of the Strip is limited to being ahead of us, but still to the right. We're now in a densely populated area, the largest in the state. The state's next largest city is Reno, another city known for its gaming. I recently flew into and out of Reno, so don't forget to check out those videos that I posted on November 18th and November 21 of 2021. I had some very interesting experiences during that trip to Reno. We're now in the control zone of the Las Vegas Airport Air Traffic Control Tower, and the approach controller has handed us off to the tower, who has cleared us to land at runway 26 left. Runway 26 left is parallel to runway 26 right, and runway 26 right is being used as the departure runway today. Airports that have parallel runways are very efficient. If you watched part one of this two-part video series, you would have seen that at JFK we took off on runway 4 left, and an arriving A380 was landing on runway 4 right. With parallel runways, a landing and takeoff can be handled simultaneously without having to cross any runways. As someone who flies into and out of LaGuardia Airport a lot, you know I'm very familiar with runway crossings and the takeoff or arrival roll. However, when we land here at Las Vegas, we'll have to cross runway 26 right to get to the terminal, but we'll be doing that at taxi speed. We're on final approach to runway 26 left. Let's land. Runway 26 left is 10,526 feet long and is situated on the airport surface at an elevation of just over 2,000 feet above sea level. So we're about 2,000 feet higher on the ground than we were when we took off from JFK, which is at sea level and very close to the Atlantic Ocean. The longer runway, runway 26 right, is off to our right, as well as the terminal complex where this flight will terminate. We are able to clear the runway on Taxiway Alpha 6, which is a little bit past the midpoint of the runway. This is a very large aircraft, and we slowed down with plenty of unused runway ahead of us. There's one taxiway between the two runways, and we're going to cross runway 26 right without having to stop. The control tower found a gap between departing flights that allows us to cross the departure runway without being a hazard to departures. This operation is very efficient for us. Anytime we stop on a taxiway, we're burning fuel, so the idea is to keep moving for fuel efficiency. We've passed our gate in the satellite concourse, so we need to turn back and head in the opposite direction to get there. This is accomplished by taking Taxiway Charlie, one of two taxiways on the terminal side of the runways that parallel the runways. There's another set of parallel runways paralleling the Las Vegas Strip, but we're not able to see them since we're on the eastern side of the airport today. We're now under the control of the airport ground controller in the tower. 
As we move along on Taxiway Charlie, we have a good view of the departures on runway 26 right, like this Southwest Boeing 737. Las Vegas is a focus city for Southwest Airlines, so you'll always see a lot of their 737 fleet here. As we get closer to the D gates, we turn to the left to approach the ramp. From here, we're afforded a good view of the lineup of departure traffic for runway 26 right. As we approach our gate, we confirm with the ramp controller, who's located in a smaller tower above the D gates, that the space is ready to receive us. We're on time today, and the gate and ramp area is clear. The ground crew gets in place, and we're marshaled into our final parking position so that all passengers, and there's a lot, can disembark. Welcome to the Las Vegas Karen Reed Airport. Many people don't know this, but the airport recently underwent a name change from McCarran to Harry Reid. The name change process started in February 2021, and it's going to take some time for everyone to get used to it. Let's head off this wide body and into the terminal. We're entering a satellite concourse that was built in 1998. The scenery out the window was absolutely fantastic. I really, really enjoyed the views of Grand Canyon and Lake Mead. And of course, I love my ride on that 767 400. It's my second time on that airplane. And by second time, I mean my second time on this exact airplane. Check out my video from November 7th of 2021 for a more in-depth look at the interior of the same exact cabin that I just flew in, the Delta One cabin. Welcome to Las Vegas. It's now time to leave the D satellite and go subterranean. I need to head to baggage claim and eventually head out of the terminal, and the only way to get there is to take a train. There are two trains that I can take, and I'm taking the train that leads to the baggage claim area for the airline that I just flew on, Delta Airlines. The train is very efficient and starts off underground and eventually emerges above ground, providing a very nice view of the ramp at Terminal 1. It's not very common for airports to have train rides like this, so I'm taking it all in. Just like the window view from the airplane, I'm enjoying the view from the train. It's a beautiful day here in Nevada, and after claiming my bag, I'll be outdoors in the dry desert heat. We're now inside Terminal 1, and I'm making my way to the ground level baggage claim area. This is a very glitzy place and hints at the glitz and glam of the mega hotels on the Las Vegas Strip where I spent the next few days. Well, that's it for this journey. From a cloudy departure at JFK to marvelous views across the USA, I've made it to America's playground, Las Vegas. Well, thanks so much for watching my video. I hope you really enjoyed my trip from New York City to Las Vegas. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already and hit that bell button so that you're alerted as to every time I post a new video for you.